Welcome to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. Hello everyone. Yeah, like Sam said, my name is Kezia and I'll be reading our first reading for tonight, which, as you can see on the screen, is on page 865 of the Bibles you might have, and it's Ezekiel chapter 36, starting at verse 22. So, starting at verse 22 and going to verse 32. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. And I'll be reading from 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to chapter 2, verse 2. If we claim to be without sin, We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Thanks, Lily, and thanks, Kezia. My name's Nick. I've got the great privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Lower Mountains Anglican. And speaking today as we hear from the Bible on forgiveness, as we continue our series in the Lord's Prayer. We live in a society that struggles with forgiveness. We don't know what to do with it. We don't understand it. Many in our society think that forgiveness is just a way to not be accountable for our actions. That it means just ignoring wrongdoing or pretending that it never happened. But as we explore what God says about forgiveness, we will see something different. We won't see everything the Bible says about forgiveness, but we will see three key areas of the story of the Bible. The temple, the cross, and the throne. As we explore these three key truths, we will see that the temple shows our need for forgiveness, the cross shows that Jesus won forgiveness for us, and the throne of God motivates us to forgive others. And we will come to realize that the forgiveness of God is better than anything our world could ever imagine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to know the forgiveness we have in you, to extend forgiveness to others and to do all things for your glory. In the name of Jesus, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Let me tell you about a man named Yasser. Yasser hated Christians. And he grew up in Sudan, where this attitude was not only accepted, but celebrated. 
At his school, there was one Christian, a young teenager named Zachariah. Yasser and his friends planned to kill Zachariah. So one night, five boys waited in ambush, ready for Zachariah to walk by. They leapt out of the tree, held Zachariah onto the ground, and beat him. Yasser described the events of that night, saying, Zachariah was screaming, he was shouting, we broke his arm, we broke his leg. He started to bleed. And because he started to scream and was begging for help, I put my hand in his mouth so that no noise would come out of him. Similar to when you were slaughtering a sheep, you know, it's just shivering. And the others were beating him. Suddenly he could no longer breathe and we could not hear his voice. We left him in the woods between life and death. And Zechariah never came back. As we consider forgiveness, it's, it's, it's easy to look at men like Yasser who have done horrible things and to know that they need forgiveness. But what about us? Us who, who might not have waited in a tree in ambush, but kicked a tree in anger. Who gather with our friends, not to kill, but maybe to drown our sorrows or to kill that part of ourselves. Who don't hold a man down to die, but instead try and push others down so that we look better. We know that they need forgiveness. What about us? The temple shows our need for forgiveness, both from others and from God. In Old Testament law, when someone wronged another person, they had to pay back what they owed that person and an additional 20%. They had to admit their wrongdoing and make amends, but yet they still, they also had to make a guilt offering, a sacrifice to God. And that's the dual nature of forgiveness. Sometimes we harm ourselves, sometimes we hurt others, but we always hurt God. So in the Old Testament, when someone admitted their guilt against another person, Leviticus chapter 6 tells us, as a penalty, they must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, their guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord and they will be forgiven for any of the things they have done that made them guilty. When we apologize to others and ask for their forgiveness, do we also confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness? When we model this to our children or to others in our lives, and ask them to apologize to each other or to someone else, do we also ask them to apologize to God? It's easy for God to be out of sight and out of mind, but we need to let the weight of this sink in for a second. Because here God gives us a visual and a sensory reminder. It's easy to think of someone bringing a cute lamb into the temple. But remember what Yasser said? Similar to when you were slaughtering a sheep, you know, it is just shivering. When the lamb is shivering in its death throes, the person making the sacrifice goes, whoa, this is a big deal. When the lamb is given at great financial cost, the person making the sacrifice knows that sin is serious, that it greatly offends God, and that it requires payment. The temple... And the sacrificial system it established showed that sin is serious. It couldn't be ignored and that forgiveness comes at the cost of a life. But why was sin so serious? Why develop this whole sacrificial system and go to such lengths to make this point clear? Because God is holy. God is holy. And this means that he is separated from sin. He cannot be in its presence. God can't tolerate sin or he wouldn't be good. He wouldn't be set apart. He wouldn't be holy. God can't let sin go unpunished. And so a sacrifice was needed. Yet there's another layer to God's holiness. For God's holiness means that not only is he separated from sin, but that he's devoted to seeking his own glory. 
As we read in Ezekiel 36 earlier, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations. Often we don't like that God seeks his own glory. We're told it's petty, but nothing could be further from the truth. God being glorified, God being at the centre of the universe, centre of life, it's like the sun being at the centre of the universe. All the planets revolving around the sun. It's good for the sun, it's good for the planets, so too is it with God's glory. It is better for everyone when God is glorified, when he is rightfully where he should be. And here's something incredible about God. He could choose to show his glory in punishing evil. After all, sin is serious, justice is important. But look at what he says he will do as we continue in Ezekiel 36. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave to your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. God's holiness means that he is separated from sin and has to punish it. Yet it also means he is devoted to seeking his glory. And he chooses to do this by restoring and forgiving his people. The temple shows our need for forgiveness. And it shows that only God can offer forgiveness. The sacrificial system was a stopgap measure that showed the seriousness of sin that justice was important, and that allowed a sinful people to live with a holy God. But as we've just read in Ezekiel, we are looking forward to something far better. Not just a stopgap sacrificial system, but true cleaning forever. And so we come to our second truth. As we see at the cross, Jesus wins our forgiveness. Remember Yasser? He had left Zechariah in the woods between life and death. But some years later, Yasser's cousin was between life and death. Two Christians came to the hospital and offered to pray for the cousin. Out of politeness, Yasser agreed. Immediately he noticed that the two men spoke to God as if he were a friend. After they prayed, the young boy opened his eyes, spoke, and even walked around for the first time in a month. It was a miracle. But one of the men turned to Yasser and said, the real miracle is that God wants to change your heart. And we remember the words of Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And Yasser's heart was changed because he came to know the forgiveness of God that was won at the cross. But God is holy. How can he be friends with an evil man like Yasser? How can he be friends with me and you, because God makes a way for sinful people to be forgiven and to live with him, and that way is Jesus. As John the Baptist says of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the true and better Lamb, the true and better sacrifice, who cries out as they are beating and killing him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
as Zechariah lay there, lifeless. His blood, like the blood of Abel, cried out for condemnation. But Jesus' blood speaks a better word. It cries out for forgiveness. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. As we read in 1 John, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. That means he is the sacrifice that takes our place, that takes our punishment. To bring us into relationship with God, he is the sacrifice that makes us at one in relationship with God. Yasser deserved death for what he did to Zachariah. And that punishment was given. It was paid in full. For the full wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. But we can often look at men like Yasser and think, that's not me. I remember the words of one pastor he was sitting in his living room, entirely peaceful. And many years before that, his brother and friends had been conscripted in the war in Angola. And what he said as we sat there in that seemingly peaceful setting really struck, struck me and stuck with me. He said, I saw those schoolboys leave as rugby players and return as war criminals. Would I have done the same? I praise God every day that I wasn't given that opportunity. Yasser is what every one of us would be if not restrained by the common grace of God. There but for the grace of God go I. You and I, we too deserve death. For the punishment for sin is death. We hurt others, and in doing so we hurt God. We hurt others, we hurt ourselves, and in doing so we also hurt God. We put ourselves first and we live out those famous words of Nietzsche, where is God? I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. We need to receive Forgiveness from God. Because if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet that punishment was given. The full wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. True forgiveness that we see in Jesus, it doesn't ignore the debt of sin. It doesn't pretend like sin never happened or that there is no cost. It is God taking that cost upon himself. God absorbing the cost, paying the debt for us. It is God absorbing the double hurt. Not only the initial hurt for which forgiveness was required, but also absorbing the cost, the debt, himself. God releases all who trust in him from the penalty for their sin, for the penalty that their sin deserves by taking it upon himself. He covers over our sin, but that doesn't mean he ignores it. It doesn't mean our sin never existed. No, it was paid in full by the blood of Jesus. And so all who call on the name of the Lord are saved and forgiven by the grace of God. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are saved by the grace of God and for the glory of God. At the cross, 
Jesus shows his holiness by punishing sin and remaining separate from it, but also by making a way for people to come into relationship with him for the glory of his name. And so forgiveness, as with all things, is about the glory of God. It is a demonstration of his goodness, his love, his holiness. Forgiveness is something God does for his glory that we receive for our necessity and for his glory. It is for our good that we receive forgiveness because we have all sinned and should face judgment and it is for God's glory that we receive forgiveness. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. And this is a game changer. Because hang on, forgiveness isn't about me anymore. It's about God and his glory. And that will change everything, especially our understanding of forgiveness and our willingness to forgive. And so we come to our third truth, and we see that the throne motivates a life of forgiveness. Remember Yasser, the persecutor of Christians who had become a follower of Jesus? When Yasser told his family that he'd become a Christian, they held a funeral for him. They lowered an empty coffin into an empty grave. But this insult, this declaration that he was dead to them, served as a reminder of forgiveness and life. For Yasser knew that he deserved to be in the grave, yet Jesus had died for him. And Yasser knew that just as his grave was empty, so too was the grave of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus has died to take the punishment for our sin, but he has risen and is now seated at the right hand of the Father to offer us new life with him forever. His grave is empty. He is seated at the right hand of God. The temple shows our need for forgiveness. The cross shows that Jesus won forgiveness. And now we look to the throne room of God where Jesus reigns in heaven from where he will return to judge and where we will one day be with him forever. Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He has won forgiveness for us and continues to speak to God, the Father of our forgiveness. The death he died, he died to, to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so we look to the throne room of God. We look to Christ and seek to live like him. We live not to seek our own glory, not to win our own praise, not to build our own kingdoms, but to bring glory to God. For that is the end result of all things. As we read in Revelation, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. We live now, having been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, looking forward to his forever kingdom. And so we can live for his glory and we can live like him. We don't have to hold on to grudges. We don't have to always wait for others to come to us. We don't have to be too proud to admit we're sorry. We can live for God's glory because it is his kingdom, his glory that matters. And he is glorified when we who have been forgiven show forgiveness to others. Forgiveness is one way in which God brings glory to his name and it's one way that we can bring glory to his name as well. For when we forgive others, we show God's love and goodness to each other and the world. Many years later, 
Yasser went to a pastor's conference in Egypt. He began talking to another pastor, and as Yasser shared his story, the man began to cry. The man said, Do you remember me? My name is Zachariah. Even though more than 25 years had passed, Yasser remembered Zachariah's screams as though they were yesterday. And then Yasser saw the man's broken arms and broken legs, the scars that he had caused. And Zechariah looked him straight in the eye, straight in the eyes and said, Yasser, because you hated me so much, I was always praying for you. And then Zechariah opened his Bible. And Yasser saw that his name was written in the first page. And so Zechariah's blood, like the blood of Christ, spoke of forgiveness for the followers of Jesus are called to forgive. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We can forgive knowing that we too have been forgiven. That our sin is serious, that we ought to be held to account, but that God for the sake of his glory had mercy and forgave us. Jesus does not command us to forgive because it is easy, but because like him we live in response to the love and glory of God the God of justice, the God of mercy, the holy God who took the cost of our forgiveness upon himself. And so no wonder our society finds it hard to forgive. If they think forgiveness is ignoring wrongdoing, if they think forgiveness means there is no justice, if they think forgiveness means pretending it never happened, or if they think forgiveness is just something you do to make yourself feel better. And no wonder Christians can forgive even though it's hard. For they know their sin was not ignored, but taken by Jesus at great cost. They know that justice was paid in blood. They know that God didn't pretend it never happened, but took it upon himself. For our good and for his glory. And so no wonder we are called to forgive for the good of others and for the glory of God. And no wonder we can pray now, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, for one day we will sing forever. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and honour and glory and praise. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information or download other resources, please visit our website at lmap.org.au.